Good evening. Um, welcome to the Committee on Fiscal Affairs. Uh, first order of business is to approve the minutes. So moved. Uh, for our last September 9th meeting. Motion to move. Do we have a second? Second. Any changes, questions, comments, edits? There being none, all in favor say aye. Aye. We have uh, two resolutions. We actually are going to have a third resolution, but we're going to do that subsequent to uh, uh, the investment update and, and where we're going to talk about our uh, this new custodian bank. Anyway, the first resolution is to authorize the general counsel to execute one or more contracts on behalf of the Office of University Controller to enter into one or more contracts with one or more vendors who will provide collection and litigation services. Uh, contracts shall be awarded to the lowest responsive and um, responsible bidder after public advertisement is still bidding by the Office of the Controller pursuant to law and regulations. The contract term for each contract shall be five years with an option for the university to terminate on each anniversary date of, of the contract. The university will use these collection and litigation services to fulfill federal, state, local laws and regulations that mandate the university to pursue delinquent student loans and other debts. Um, do I have a motion? So move. Okay. Second. Oh, second. Okay. Any questions, comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, the next is a resolution authorized Hunter College to implement an increase in dormitory fees beginning in spring 2010. The dormitory fees will increase a total of 15% in the spring and additionally 18% to be effective fall of 2010. The current dormitory fees range from $348 to $624 monthly for a nine-month school year and will be increased to $462 to $833 per month by spring 2011 for the nine-month school year, depending on the type of resident room. The increase will also proportionally affect the dormitory fees for the summer months beginning in the summer of next year. Uh, the fee increase is needed to maintain the condition of the complex as well as to provide for regular replacement cycle for dormitory furniture and equipment. Do we have a motion? So move. Second. Okay. Questions? Comments? These are, these are fees. This is the room rent. That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. These are the Not on top of room rent. No, that is the room rent. That is Thank the you. room rent. It's, it's a so fabulous deal. Can I get one of those rooms? I'm just going to say well, I'm moving. You, know, you have you to need a roommate. first. You'll need a roommate, though. <laughs> I think. There being no further questions or comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Oh, any opposed? Tell Jennifer it passed unanimously. Um, now I'll report on the investment portfolio. Uh, turn it over to Janet Crone, where I want to congratulate you at least on the first page of the report. I read the whole thing. 19% <laughs> year to date. Very good. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our consultants, Cambridge Associates, Thomas Schmidt Jefferson and Mark Fowler, and they're going to make a presentation, market update on the uh, the investment pool, as well as make a recommendation for an international equity manager. Okay. We've been asked to keep these comments brief. Uh, the news is pretty good, so I think we can uh, cruise through this uh, quite quickly. Uh, if you want to grab. The discussion Joe, materials. Excuse me. Stop going to executive We're supposed session. We're going to go into executive session. We have to go into executive session. Okay. Okay. People in the room do this? Time? No, no, they can. No, it's they just can the say move, move for executive session. Do we need a vote to do this? Yes. now out of executive session and uh, Barry I think there's a, a desire to appoint State Street Bank and Trust Company as a custodian if you'd like to introduce the resolution that would be great. Uh, thank you you have a resolution before you to uh, uh, have uh, State Street uh, as the uh, custodian uh, for the university's uh, investments uh, uh, we have a uh, have had a long-standing relationship with uh, JP Morgan Chase that probably goes back to the uh, 1980s uh, for uh, custodial services. 
In recent years, we've uh, had some challenges in working with Chase. Uh, we have not been happy with the timeliness of reports. We've, not, uh, we've had some uh, issues with their uh, ability to present reports at a year-end accounting for, uh, for our fiscal uh, financial audits. And more importantly, um, we are using a uh, legacy uh, system uh, to do our investment accounting. And one of the questions that we've uh, raised with Chase is the extent to which they could, uh, we could outsource that uh, work uh, to them. Uh, and after receiving answers that were not completely satisfactory, we decided to go out and do a, uh, a, a, an RFP uh, to, uh, uh, for investment services. We contacted three of the major uh, firms doing this. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase happens to be one. Uh, State Street is another. And uh, Bank of New York was the third. Uh, Bank of New York did not respond to our request for information. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and, uh, and State Street did. And after uh, listening to the presentations and, uh, and uh, evaluating the uh, information that we had, uh, we decided that we would go ahead and uh, recommend that State Street uh, handle the custodial services for the uh, university. And uh, we'd like that to take effect as of January 1st of uh, 2010. The resolutions in front of us. Um, we'll move, I'll move the resolution, then I'll also open it for questions and other considerations. So moved? Yes. Seconded? Second. Any questions, comments? I just have a caveat. And the caveat is with the TPA using PeopleSoft, there's a history of a lot of glitches. But we've got to be careful with right. people. Right. right. That was one of the pluses as well, is that they're very conversant in PeopleSoft mm -hmm. and so would further facilitate the use of CUNY first. Uh, State Street has a, uh, has a record in, uh, in uh, dealing with PeopleSoft and interfacing with PeopleSoft. Uh, J.P. Morgan did not have that, uh, that oh, history. Oh, I know. I'm aware of that. Uh, if you don't use PeopleSoft, can you go to Accenture? Uh, no. We're, we're committed to go with PeopleSoft. Okay. And, and, and the, the important thing is that the PeopleSoft, um, the software does not have investment accounting in it. So in a sense, what we're going to be doing is really just doing what they call a spreadsheet upload into, the, uh, into our financial. And then you'll do the, the uh, interface. You'll do the interface yes, yourself we will. here? Yes, we will. They better give us a financial discount. I'm sorry? They better give us a, diff a discount. Yes. <laughs> Always. Later, okay, you'll explain all that to me. <laughs> <laughs> How'd Matt do it? It's all Matt. <laughs> there being no further questions or comments, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Vice Chancellor Malave to discuss the current status and situation with the state budget, the city budget, as well as our request, uh, budget request for the upcoming uh, fiscal year. Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and, and good to see you again. <clears throat> Let me first tell you what you have um, before you. There are two documents that are key documents. One, you've, you've seen the budget resolution under request um, that is accompanied by the the blue book, which is the one that has the most of the narrative for the budget request, as well as most of the detailed tables, which I will not be going through um, this, this afternoon. I will, however, be going through the PowerPoint presentation that, that is before you, uh, that is entitled the 2010 budget request. But what I'd like to do first is just sort of lay the, the contact and, in effect, give you the, the, the report on the state and city budgets in the first instance, because that will lay the groundwork and the framework for the discussion of the budget request. And, and in fact, if you can go to the PowerPoint presentation uh, and go to page, I'll go to the first page, in which you'll see the, uh, the current budget conditions, the national context, and the outlook uh, for 2011. Well, we start off with the, with the budget conditions in the state of New York in the current year, and many of you have been keeping abreast of the, of the, from the newspaper reports of the, what is now estimated to be a $3.2 billion budget shortfall for the state of New York. Uh, that $3.2 billion figure uh, was announced on Friday when the New York State Budget Division issued its mid-year report, uh, which is required of the Budget Division every quarter. Um, the last quarter, and in fact, the last time I think we met, 
um, the state was projecting a you know, current year budget deficit of $2.1 billion. So between the last time that we met and today, the state deficit has grown by $1.1 billion. Um, and so you could, and I'll come back to the, to the challenges that that's presenting to the CUNY budget in the current year. Um, the state has also revised its estimate of the budget deficit for next year from $4.6 billion to $6.8 billion. Um, and th that is the year in which we will be requesting resources, and it's an important number to take into account. Um, and that figure rises to $14.8 billion as a projected deficit. That's up from $13.3 billion that the budget division had estimated back in the first quarter report. Um, so as you can see, the, the budget deficit condition of the state of New York deteriorates, particularly in fiscal 2012, which is when the scheduled um, billions of dollars in federal stimulus leave or scheduled out of the, of the New York State finances. As you know, the, the federal government uh, came up with its investment program, excuse me, its, its program to, to assist the states. Uh, and in, for the state of New York, that represented roughly $5 billion a year in discretionary dollars that it used to, to sustain uh, and to avert major, major reductions in both 2010 and 2011, mostly in the area of education. And, and we were beneficiaries of that in that it's, it helped stabilize the state budget. But in fiscal 2012, that, that stimulus package is scheduled to, to go away. Um, so you know, recall that last year, at the beginning of the fiscal crisis, the university sustained um, $68.3 million in budget reductions. Uh, we were able to manage those reductions, if you recall, albeit with some stress on the campuses. Uh, we were able to protect the core services and academic and support services, but it nevertheless had a, a real impact in, in, in last year. Uh, what the governor is proposing as part of the plan to deal with the $3.2 billion deficit is a number of things. It's $1.8 billion in across the board reductions um, to state agencies and spending in local assistance, most of which affects education and healthcare, and about $1.2 billion in other actions, um, whether that be um, actions that will generate more revenue or actions that will improve um, collections of debts and better debt management for a total of 1.2, but the key component is $1.8 million in across the board reductions. The governor had announced uh, about a month ago the initial installment of $500 million against that $1.8 billion in cuts and recommended a reduction in CUNY senior colleges of $53 million as a result of our contribution to that $500 million um, plan. Um, that was in addition to other cuts that were made in higher education, $90 million for the State University of New York, and at the time, $36 million for the Higher Education Services Corporation. So of the $500 million, about $180 million, or nearly, or over a third, was targeted to higher ed. So just put that on, on one corner. Um, the governor had also advised the legislature that that was only the down payment on um, what was then a $2.1 billion problem, which rose to $3 billion. And the governor recently announced uh, and put together a menu of options for the legislature to consider, and that was yet another $1.3 billion to add to the 0.5 for that 1.8. And that included across the board reductions of mostly 10% uh, against unexpended expenditures um, for the state of New York and for local um, governments and entities. Uh, with the exception of the education sector, which the governor had recommended, cuts to no greater than 4.5%. Uh, nevertheless, that was the package. For CUNY, um, the community colleges in the City University of New York are included in the local assistance budget as aid to local governments. And as a consequence now, invited the community colleges to share in, in the budget <coughs> reduction proposal. So in addition to the $53 million for the senior colleges, now there's $9.9 .9 million in recommended reductions to aid for the community colleges. So the total challenge for the university at this point is a $63 million reduction in public support that is now before the legislature under the consideration. <coughs> in addition to that, the, the governor has proposed similarly reductions to State University of New York Community Colleges. And in addition to that, um, I had referenced earlier the Higher Education Services Corporation as a state um, agency being reduced by $36 million now and local assistance with a TAP program is funded, the government has recommended a reduction of $26 million. 
that 10% across the board reduction amounts to what is being recommended by the executive, $120 decrease in the award schedule for students receiving TAP. So what we're looking at is a reduction in financial aid for the students. That is also being considered by the legislature as we speak. So the total package, and there are a few other reductions that are being recommended in higher education um, programs, special programs in the private sector, Bundy aid, and a few other programs that are administered by the state education department. In total, the higher education sector is staring at about $241 million in cuts against the $1.8 billion in cuts that the governor is recommending and is now before the legislature. And I say, you know, before the legislature, we're not, we're not certain exactly what they're intending to do. Um, it, the governor has scheduled a special session for November 10th um, um, to invite the legislature to consider his proposals or perhaps any other proposals that the, that the both the assembly and or the Senate um, represent. Um, for the university, obviously, um, it is a repeat of last year. What, what do we do? We have a mid-year um, challenge. Um, our initial response is that we're working with the, the governor and the legislature to try to, to deal with the budget challenges. We recognize that we need to share in the, in the sacrifices that have to be made um, in the state of New York. We want to be treated fairly, of course, um, in this context. We want to make sure that we protect our core mission in academic support and civil services. And that is our charge. That is the mandate that the chancellor has given us. Uh, and, and I believe that we are, you know, we're close to getting there, obviously. Um, as the chancellor has indicated in his testimony, this clearly puts a, um, a, a hamp it, it hampers our, our plans for investment in the university at the time that we have tremendous enrollment growth. You've all seen the numbers. Um, the enrollment at the community colleges is up on an FTE basis, 13%. Um, and the senior college is up 6.5%. So it's clear that we have much more to do and, and we have great demand at the university and, we are, and we're dealing with it. But, but we also recognize that, that we need to manage it. Uh, <clears throat> and, and I think that between the actions that we have taken thus far, um, and I think you'll recall at this committee when I was reporting on the adopted budget, that the question for us three months from now would be, whether or not the budget would hold. And, and we have taken and made provisions with the campus and we did the initial allocation that we were, there was probably a better than 50% chance that it would not hold and that they needed to set aside appropriate reserves. So we have, and the colleges, um, notwithstanding the, the challenges, have set aside some reserves so we have some capacity to deal with it, but it's clearly going to put stresses on the university's budget. But, but, it, but we believe there's a path to to get through this year, uh, if we're treated fairly, um, we are concerned, obviously, about the long-term effects that these cuts are recurring. And while we're able to use one-time reserves and, and colleges are able to, to go into their rainy day funds, uh, there's only so many of those that are available. And so we obviously have to be very concerned about the future. And, and I think you've heard the Chancellor mention before it, at, at board meetings, the budget working groups that he has established um, for us to engage and the serious kind of work, the analytical work, the budget work um, that needs to be done in order to plan properly. So I will, we will be doing all of that. We continue to do that. We'll have more information on November 10th, 11th, or 12th, or whenever the legislature acts. But, and, and we're not certain whether they're going to act or not. It, it's conceivable that they won't act. Uh, and, and that what will happen is the, the $3.2 billion challenge that that the state faces basically rolls into 2011. And so the, the only question is when you're dealing with it. Are you either going to be dealing with it now or are you going to be dealing with it later? Uh, and, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to predict what the legislature is going to do, except that we're planning for various um, options and various um, actions or lack of actions by the legislature to make sure that we get through our fiscal year and we get through our academic year, making sure that the, that the investments that we need to make that we're making and that the plans that we need to put into place to position ourselves properly for 2011 are being considered properly by the college administration. So that's the backdrop on the state side. On the city side, there's an election tomorrow. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about the negatives next month. <laughs> um, we'll come back to, to, to questions before we go into the budget request. The, the city of New York, and I think some of you have, have read some of these reports, uh, the, were, was not, they were a bit more conservative in their in their revenue estimates um, going forward. And so 
they find themselves no doubt challenged, and no doubt they're waiting to see what the legislature is going to do to them uh, before they then figure out what they're going to pass on to us. Um, but the fiscal situation is not as, as, as um, the, it's not deteriorating as quickly, in part because they, they didn't make the kind of estimates, um, they didn't have the kind of rosy scenarios that can only, uh, that, that the Albany um, budget had included in their <coughs> enactment back in April. So I think the situation is a little bit better. However, it is, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if, if we get some significant budget challenges there as well. I just don't believe that it's going to be as significant. Um, as the budget challenges that the state of New York is facing. So that's the backdrop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the backdrop. Um, and I can take questions now, and then we'll go straight into the budget request message, whatever the pleasure of the committee. Okay. Um, so let's just continue with the presentation then. Um, on page three. So all of that notwithstanding, um, the... The university continues what we believe to be the, the appropriate budget message. In fact, it's even more appropriate under the circumstances. Um, and that is the, the, the CUNY Compact, which we, which we posit in the first instance that we need a, a budget approach that, and a budget message that, that includes um, shared responsibilities, partnerships, and it's more than one entity's um, responsibility for financing the needs of the university. And so we're going to continue um, the CUNY Compact. And, and as a reminder, let me just, um, on page four, go over what the key elements of the compact are. And that is, we believe as a public university that the public still has the lion's share of responsibility for financing the needs of the university. And, and that continues to be our message here. We would like the state and the city to, to fund 100% of the mandatory cost increases. Those are largely the costs associated with um, French benefits and energy and the contracts that the state and city um, political leadership has signed off on. Um, and we want them to pay for a share, but just a share of the investment program. And the commitment of the university is that we will find a way through our other partners of financing the other shares of the investment program. And as you know, the, those shares are the three groups. They're the friends of the university through um, a continued emphasis and perhaps even more so on philanthropy, notwithstanding the market conditions. Um, we believe that's a continued source of revenue. Um, and what we began several years ago in this university in wrapping up our philanthropy needs to, to in effect, be redoubled on, under, the, under the circumstances. Um, the university, another key player, the, we continue to receive a considerable amount of public support. It may not be exactly what we think we ought to have, but it's nevertheless considerable. And we, we get considerable revenues from tuition, and we have a responsibility to always reshape our budget, always look at opportunities for efficiencies and productivity, and that work continues. And we require the self-financing of our investment opportunities by, by pushing the colleges and the university administration to continue to do that. And then finally, the students uh, through two, a, compound, a component of um, increased enrollment growth. Now, as you can tell from the numbers that I've I mentioned earlier there are limitations on enrollment growth, and this budget message recognizes that. But nevertheless, we believe that there will be some modest growth um, in the future. That will generate additional revenue for, for the system to plow into investment. And the idea is that it, it go for investment, and it doesn't go for the mandatory cost. And hopefully, we'll get some consideration. And in this case, we're recommending a 2% increase in tuition, which is $45 per semester at the senior colleges and $30 per semester at the community colleges, much less than the 15% that we did this past year, which we did under extraordinary um, circumstances for the state. So this is more, much more, in fact, uh, if you go back to the original compact, and we only talked about increases that were tied to an index, the higher education index across this, the country for public universities is pegged at 2%, and that's what we're pegging this proposal. And as it's always the case, three things are, are true here. The TAP program, the state of New York, which is a very generous program, um, continues to fund fully all the, uh, whatever increases are, are in place for public universities. For, just as a reminder, our tuition is currently at, at $4,600 for the senior colleges, <coughs> excuse me, and 3150 for the community colleges. The state of New York has a program for tuition assistance that it fully covers 
up to $5,000 for the most needy students. So all the needy students don't pay anything, haven't paid in 25, 30 years. We, we will continue not to pay. The chancellor has made a commitment um, that students who are nevertheless fiscally challenged, albeit with a modest tuition increase, will get the kind of assistance they will need and they will not lose their matriculation. That commitment continues. And the federal government, as part of the similar proposals that, that the governor and, and excuse me, that the president and the legislature are enacting, increases the Pell Grant to the students by $200. So there are a number of things that are happening that I know will protect the needy of students at the university. And that's an important um, thing to remember as we move forward. Ernesto, can I ask, um, I, I keep hearing about, about uh, students who aren't protected by TAP or Pell. Do you have a, a sense of which of our, what categories of our students uh, who, who with incomes under, say, 50,000 are not protected by either TAP or Pell? Well, the, the, the... Is it the undocumented students? Well, the, you, you have clearly the undocumented student, and you have the, the international students, obviously. Um, then you also have a class of students that are the so-called independent students, um, where the state of New York has a schedule um, that if you're a certain age, uh, you, could, you could be an independent student not living at home, have an income of $7,000, uh, and get no more than a $3,000 tap based on what, your, the family's income you based on buying? Based on their income, um, but the, the state of New York has never adjusted that schedule um, to go up to the current level. So right now we have a tuition of $4,600, but the maximum award for that class of students is only 3000 which was a big um, concern when we served on the Commission for Higher Ed, that that would be one of the, model, one of the reforms in the TAP program. So that's, that's clearly one class. Uh, so they're, they're, those are largely the classes of students that are that are going to be impacted. And the do you have a sense of what, just roughly, what percentage of our student body by the, at the senior colleges and the community colleges fall into one of those categories where they're not being protected by Pell or TAP? Um, I, I would think that if I, ha if I had to guess, um, it, it would be around maybe 10% of the population. Um, and because the other piece is that we have a lot of scholarship funds that the colleges use. And in fact, many of the colleges use foundation resources and the like that are sort of off balance and it's hard for us to see, but clearly the colleges go out of their way to, to help those students with those private funds meet the costs associated with it. And, and do those students fit into the chancellor's program of holding harmless students who can't Well, that's what the chancellor, tuition. that's what the chancellor means when he says, yeah, well, for those students who are challenged, it's an obligation and responsibility of the colleges to find a way. Now we have some modest resources that we made available in the current year for a class of students. We have some employment opportunities that we made available when we had the big tuition increase. Um, but even before we had the big tuition increase, that was always a mantra of this chancellor to, to make sure that no student is at risk of matriculation um, by virtue of a, of a modest tuition increase. I know the, uh, the, the majority in, in that group are international students, and for them, for that, those students to get into the United States with the proper visas and so forth, they have to certify that they have the financial wherewithal to not only pay tuition but to live. And so for many of those students, uh, while they are not covered by state or federal financial aid, they do have the financial wherewithal. So when you whittle that down, it's a much smaller uh, population. But part, what's about part-time students? They're not. Well, part-time students are eligible for federal Pell Grants. They are? They mm -hmm. are. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's one of the important distinctions between the, the federal program and the state. Program. They don't do that. Well, there's a limited part-time program small, for TAP. Small it's a part-time TAP program. But this, this uh, targeted... Um, um, tuition increase assumes that in this election year we get this. I'm sorry. I think this increase assumes that we get this. I'm being facetious, but in, in terms of this election year that we're going to ask them to pass this tuition increase. Well, we're going to ask them to, to give us the, uh, the well, all we, all we, all, they, they can't pass it. We're the only ones who could pass the tuition increase, but they must increase our revenue appropriation in order for us to capture that revenue. Uh, 
This is what we have done for the past four years as part of our compact request. Uh, and in some years, in fact, in some of the very good years, um, Vice Chancellor Dobin will, will remind me they, the legislature was, was so inclined to sort of buy out the, the tuition component right. of the proposal. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure they've been in a position to do that. Not to worry. This is probably the best yeah. scenario that we can envisage for the students going forward, given the kind of climate that we are coming into for the next fiscal year. And, and really the choice is, is, you know, whether we have, albeit a modest investment program, going forward to meet this growing, growing um, student enrollment. And, and we believe that it, it, if the 2% is modest, it's, it's consistent with our approach. And, uh, and, and more importantly, it, it goes back to what I suggested earlier, that this is, this is how you, you partner with the state under extraordinarily difficult <coughs> times. And I think that, and this is how you partner with the university, this is how you partner with friends and philanthropists at the university where they see that everyone is making a contribution, albeit a small one and albeit a challenging one depending on who you are. Could I ask one more question about the compact in this sure. context? You know, given the reality that it's unlikely to get any increased funding for, I mean, for forget mandated costs for any growth, um, the way the compact has been structured over the year, it's, it's I can't imagine how we're going to successfully get the state to give us more money for their share of the compact. Um, is there is there any talk or is there a way to, as part of, you know, in the component that you've always looked at as the university's effort, which is productivity pieces within the university, to take to take a chunk of what used to be university-related activities, but to go through what state laws exist that one could propose changes to to provide productivity abilities of where the state can, where the city university can more productively <coughs> use its resources and almost offer to give the state credit as that would help count toward their match to do state law changes that we would propose to them. This is, <coughs> this is part of the uh, mandate that we've given to one of the working groups, mm -hmm. uh, the three working groups that uh, we established, one dealing with drilling deep into the bedrock of what defines the operating needs, uh, the second looking at our um, monetizing whatever physical assets that we have that could be reprogrammed into the budget, and the third, which is uh, in, in one sense the most challenging and far-reaching, is to really look at the regulatory environment under which we work and the, uh, the, the laws that govern uh, the university, both at state laws and, and, and laws that we have developed here through the bylaws of, of the university. But to propose it as part of and what you would give credit as the state share that would be for correct. the compact. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Right. Okay, um, if you could turn to page five, just to go over the high-level uh, budget numbers. Uh, this would be requested appropriations. Uh, and, and you can, you would start at the, at the left-hand column of the current 2000 adopted budget. You'll see we get roughly $1.3 billion in state support, a little under $300 million in city support, and a billion dollars that we generate in tuition for a total budget of $2.6 billion, that is our current base. Our mandatory needs um, going forward in 2011 are scheduled currently at $91.7 million, um, and that is, again, largely, as I said earlier, driven by both fringe benefits and, and, the, and contractual obligations. The good, the good piece is on the energy side, that's a deflationary environment that we are in the energy and the utilities, so there's not a whole lot of increased costs associated with energy. So we, we caught a little break, but, but not a whole lot, um, given that the, the health care costs and the pension costs and, and others continue to rise. So you can see that that sort of dominates the, 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 the amount that we're seeking in, in state support. Um, moving forward, you'll see the shaded um, areas where we're looking for the programmatic request. And here is the investment program. And here's how we're proposing to finance the investment program um, with $28.8 million in, 
an additional state support and city and the state support, and that amounts to 2.2 percent increase. We consider that to be we're relatively modest for a, an investment program. On the state side, as you can see, we're asking for an increase in revenue appropriations of 33.8 million to help accommodate that that investment program for a grand total of 155 million dollars in requested appropriations to cover to cover the this particular request. And I should just add that on the and I'll come back to this in a minute. On the state side, the the requested appropriations are 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 also on the community college <coughs> side. And unlike the senior colleges, the community colleges are funded on a formula basis um, that increases support automatically um, for aid for additional enrollment. It sort of reimburses um, and so this tremendous surge that we've experienced over the past couple of years and we will continue to schedule the next year is generating additional support and it's, and it's reflected in those numbers. So these numbers reflect what we anticipate we'll be getting as a result of the additional state aid that we're going to plow into the investment program. So how, how much of the, of the tuition is the tuition increase? The up? The 33 is? The $33 uh, million, dollars, the tuition increase component, I think it's 28, 28. Or $28 mm -hmm. million. Dollars. Uh, and, and I have a funding source on the next couple of pages that I'll, that I'll review that. All right, so $1.4 billion is the overall request. State aid, a little under 300 million city support. The tuition number goes up by 34 for a total request of $2.7 billion for the university. Um, all right, the next page, next schedule is for the total requested increases by these areas, and you'll, you'll find and you'll see that these are very familiar um, terms because they go back to the master plan that this board enacted, um, which has a, a component of the flagship environment, which where we anchor uh, many of our academic initiatives, and principally that's represented in the desire to increase the number of full-time faculty, um, the research environment that is dominated by the interest um, that we have in the, the subsequent investments uh, in research that, are, that follow the big investments in the capital side in our science buildings as part of the decade of the science. Um, that's at $11.3 million. Student services, uh, which in this case, in this instance, uh, we're focusing on basically services for students with disabilities uh, and, um, and the health care centers of the university. Um, we have been doing some work. We recognize that we need to make some investments in healthcare services and in a couple of those areas. Last year, the budget message of the university was focused on financial aid, career counseling, and veteran services. This sort of shifts a little bit to focus to some areas that were not uh, the dominant focus then. The other key piece, and then you'll find this in the, in the materials, is on educational technology. Uh, we believe very strongly that we need to do much, much more in this university in this area, uh, we don't believe we're going to meet our challenges of, of enrollment and meeting the needs of all this enrollment growth unless we really ramp up significantly um, what we need to do in, every, in the area of educational technology, and that is reflected here as well. Uh, the other good, big piece of this facility improvement is a large number, um, and that is dominated by a significant request for four new facilities that are coming online, the most significant one being Micro Everest. Academic Complex One. It's a very significant facility. It's about 200,000 additional square feet. It's a state-of-the-art science building. Um, it's going to require lots of resources when it opens up. It is scheduled to open up this summer and this September. Um, and, and about $7 million will be needed just to, to meet the, the engineering, custodial, security, and technical services of the building. Um, we have also buildings that at Brooklyn College, the West Quad building. Uh, Corey, you probably know um, the, the needs for that building. Um, we have a media center at Lehman College that needs to be staffed properly, otherwise the initial investment in the capital side will go by the wayside. And we also have the Roosevelt House uh, at Hunter College. Those are the key components of new buildings. Those are not insignificant costs that, are, that need to be reflected, <coughs> need to be understood. Uh, we will have to then you know, deal with the the challenges of financing it once we know what our budget is, but it's important that we know what they are. Educational uh, technology people, or? It's both. It's, it's a lot of people, a lot of faculty development, uh, but it's both. It's both infrastructure support on the campuses um, that are non-capital in nature, 
but it, it's the human infrastructure that needs to be developed across the university um, to really sort of lay the groundwork for, for the kind of educational technology that we need. So do you call it software development and, and all of that capital, or, I mean, their, their average life isn't such that you would... Well, they're both. Things. There's a... The answer is it depends. Right. If it's part of a system, so let's say software for CUNY first is capital eligible. If you buy software to put it in your PC and one or two PCs, it wouldn't work. Or just the wiring. I mean, when we're looking at a lot of the buildings, they're just not wired. The wiring I'm would generally be capital eligible. We try to use that capital budget as much as I can. Yeah, yeah. Really but that's, that's not in, like that's so right. wiring would not be in this. <laughs> no, no, I, I agree. It's, it, it, it sort of depends, and uh, and it, you get you know money's money this, in this area, uh, but but clearly the human infrastructure, um, the need to hire full time faculty that are that are versed in, in technology is very important. Uh, to the, the training that exists, we have thousands of faculty members in this university that need to be trained in educational technology. That is not, um, those are expensive propositions because uh, that's, that's the workforce that we need to, to, to strengthen in this area. And so it's a combination of both infrastructure and, and human. On page seven. Ernesto, could I just, sure. why would the facility improvements not be in the capital budget? Well, there, there are certain things that are that 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 are laboratory needs. For example, you have a little laboratory upgrade um, in the sciences. It may be a hundred thousand dollars to to retrofit and renovate a minor renovation in the library. I, I would I would tell you that, and I, and I don't know exactly all the details, but the capital budget will include a considerable amount of facility improvements. But there are a couple of components that are that are that are often supported by the operating budget. It wouldn't be. If you, if you paint the building, that's not capital eligible. Right, right. You replace the roof, it's not capital eligible. It's, there are accounting rules. Barring Barrow explained it to you. There, it's hard to imagine things that used to be capital are not anymore. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to change that. Too. Okay. Okay, well, on page seven, I think I just repeated everything that I just uh, went over. I won't do that again. The on page eight. You'll see a finer detail here of the specific breakdown between senior and committees. You'll, you'll see a minor entry there for the School of Pharmacy, which is a planning um, amount. Um, there's a lot of work that's going on um, in, in developing and, and constructing um, you know, potential plans. Um, this facilitates that effort, hopefully, that, uh, for a School of Pharmacy. That is, again, part of the university's request. And, and totals the investment program of $70.7 million. On page nine, you'll see the, the, uh, <coughs> the mandatory needs and how that $92 million breaks out between senior and community, between fringe benefit energy and building rentals and the OTPS inflation and the salary increments that are, ones that are driven by the contractual agreements that are provided. On page 10, to deal with Trustee Shaw's question of the funding sources, um, the breakdown between senior and community colleges. You'll see the, the breakdown here. Uh, the state and city mandatory needs at $80.5 million. Programmatic initiatives at 11.7. The tuition increase component is $28 million. The enrollment growth element associated with tuition revenue coming in is five. And then we have the restructuring and the philanthropy components totaling $162.4 million. On the next page, you can just see the... The enrollment, excuse me, the enrollment growth <coughs> isn't assumed across all campuses. It assumes that some campuses have more. It, it's a general 0.5%, um, but as you may have detected from previous uh, proposals, in, in previous years we had the compact that was based on revenue generated at 1.5%, um, and here we are at 13%, 8%, 6% increases. Uh, it's a general number at this point. We recognize that some campuses will be a little bit further up, and others may be flat, others may be in a declining mode. Uh, but at this point, we just sort of assume that the 0 0.5 is it's a fairly static number. It's not, it's not a, a lot of growth, but you're right. It, it could fluctuate depending on where we go about going. But as we construct the budget, it is across the board. Because aren't there some campuses that are at beyond full capacity? Or that now? But that's, 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 what I, yeah. that's why I recognize that. We probably have, I think, uh, Dolan would always say we have, we have the MCC and we have everyone else. Um, and, but, but it's also true that, that 
I think that while we're clearly challenged by our physical space, there are other opportunities that we're challenging the campuses um, to take advantage of. I think if Borough Manhattan Community College has demonstrated that there are days and weekends and evenings that can be deployed uh, much more efficiently, and then we're, we're calling on, on the rest of the colleges to begin to, to sort of move in that direction as well. Have any campuses restricted enrollment on account of no room? Um, you know, we had a, um, a very thorough discussion about enrollment strategies uh, this morning uh, with the Council of Presidents. What we mm -hmm. did do is cut off enrollment uh, at some of our community colleges a couple of months, month, two months before we traditionally have done it because there was just, the system was so stressed that we could not uh, morally, uh, you know, take in more students and assume that we could do the job that we did. So what, what we're embarking upon now, we, we started an enrollment management process two to three years ago, but it's really revamped up to a, a very important activity here at the university. It's going to require uh, very close monitoring, uh, real strong management in the way that we utilize our facilities, uh, different modalities of instruction. That's why we put in some more money on educational technologies because this university is only at a very nascent stage of development in its ability to use technology as a real modality for instruction. So we have some real challenges ahead, and uh, I, I, am, I believe that in the next few years we're going to continue to see large uh, interest uh, in students attending uh, the university. And the problem is being compounded by retention rates really spiking mm -hmm. at the university. That is a result of, I would, I would submit two things, the very aggressive faculty hiring that we've done. We, we've um, increased the full-time faculty from 5,400 in 1999. We project it'll be at about 7,100 mm -hmm. uh, this spring. And that makes a difference. Uh, let nobody tell you otherwise. Having full-time faculty in front of the classroom does make a difference in student learning. And third, uh, most of our campuses have increased the uh, uh, quality of the incoming students. So as a result of that, the students are taking more classes, and they're succeeding in record numbers. So we are, we are being challenged by our own successes in what we've done, but also the economy being as uh, poor as it is, uh, requires that the university make itself available to students who are out of jobs, looking for jobs, need to shore up their skills. So we have real challenges here with a, a uh, physical plant that is not infinite uh, and ways of utilizing the campuses in, uh, in more creative ways than we had before. Uh, but I think we're up to the challenge, but it's going to require uh, a lot of uh, vigilance and very, very strong management on behalf of each of our presidents. And uh, we discussed this at great length this morning. Uh, and I think we're up, we're up to it. I want to congratulate the uh, Office of Enrollment Management has been very aggressive about getting the word out, at least to the public schools that I know, about how you know, you used to be have rolling enrollment until May, June, July, and they have been letting the word get out that they may be cutting it off as early as April this year. But they are getting that word out to the schools, and so um, it's it's um, having an impact upon the students. So that's the good news. I, I would add that um, for those campuses <coughs> that, that closed a little early um, this year, the the colleges worked very closely together to make sure that 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 student understood that there were opportunities available at another CUNY college. So the, if a student came in and wanted to go to LaGuardia, and LaGuardia had to cut off earlier than they would otherwise have been, though that college was directed to then take that student 
and advise them and assist them in getting to another university mm -hmm. unit. So, and, and I think the colleges work very closely to, to make sure that that happens. What, what's the trend line on, on restructuring and finance free percentages? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The trend line. It looks like about 3.4% is going to be restructuring and 3.4% is philanthropy. Okay. How has that percentage changed <clears throat> historically? Is that, is that smaller this year than last year? It, it, it's a little smaller in recognizing the, the, the market conditions, particularly. Uh, we felt we needed to, to just ramp it down a little bit, um, given the, the challenges and that many of these funds were underwater. Um, and I expect that to, to, to change moving forward. But it, it, it was a little bit less than, than last year's. And restructuring as well? A little bit, correct. Given that we took a sixty-eight point three million dollar hit last year. Mm -hmm. the, the, and, and following your question, uh, Terry, and piggybacking on Trustee Shaw's question, the big moves are yet to come as we have discussions uh, with state government on how we can account for revenue by changing the way in which we do business. And I would put that under productivity and efficiencies. And we've started those discussions. Uh, SUNY and CUNY are working very much in tandem, shoulder to shoulder, to, to get some of those ideas across. And, and I suspect that we're going to be successful at, at some yeah. point where you'll start to see that component of the compact really spiking. Thank you. Okay, and, and speaking of trends, uh, the last two uh, pages, uh, or the next to last two pages. I'd just like to uh, comment on Chairman Schmidt's uh, remarks. It's certainly going to be a challenge for this university to maintain the openness that it's mandated for the community colleges and the comprehensive colleges. It's the idea of cutting off enrollment early is certainly an expedient that had to be done in order to maintain. Uh, the quality that we require of CUNY, but at some point we will have to maintain also that openness to high school students' access to the community colleges. And it's going to be a challenge. Okay. Mm -hmm. As I started to say on page 12 and 13, you, you see the graphic of, of exactly what we're talking about when, when we look at the University of Enrollment at nearly 260,000. Um, the first page is on headcount, and you can see an even greater jump in 2009 on the, on the FTE. So this, is, this really tells a story of, of why, why we need to, to make the investments, and I know what we're going to be challenged and how we make those investments going forward, but we need, to, we need to lay out in our budget message what our needs are, and that is what is our attempt here. And then finally on page 14 and 15, just to give you a sense of, of what the, the, our competition is, um, the New York City area tuition levels and where we are at 4,600 and where we propose to be at, at 4,690 as a modest contribution to the investment group. Um, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my May I ask, if, uh, is the plan to hire 250 new full-time faculty, will, will that increase the size of the full-time faculty or, or? No, that would be, it would, it would represent a net increase in full, that is our, it, it, it is to increase the number of full-time faculty. The absolute number. Can I also recommend that you put in what the um, New Jersey? Because okay. we're seeing new people from New Jersey coming over because we're we're a. Uh, a I, I could add today. New Jersey. Sure. So they're, they're not that far away. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing them coming over. What is the process from this point forward, and so the timing of delivery and the lobbying effort and all the rest? Uh, my Vice Chancellor Hutchinson could speak to the lobbying effort. The, right now, the, this is transmitted to the, to the executive. Uh, well, first, the, the board uh, will have a, a budget special hearing on the budget request as part of its regular hearing process. Mm -hmm. um, the board will consider the budget request at the end of the month. And I believe that's November 23rd. Uh, the, the State Budget Division and others have already issued a call letter, but they recognize that both in the case of CUNY and SUNY, you operate on a different timetable, mm -hmm. and the boards won't act until November. Uh, we expect the governor to issue the executive budget recommendations at some point in January after the state of the state address. Uh, we will then know exactly what uh, 
what our challenge is. Mm -hmm. uh, between now and then, there'll be lots of discussion between us and the budget division um, and others on our budget message. The same budget message will be delivered to the to the mayor and the city council. Um, they they operate on a slightly different schedule. The mayor's executive budget is not issued until um, actually in April, early May, albeit although in, in in January they issue a preliminary budget. So we'll get a lens on the city finances in February, but the actual executive budget that's akin to the governor's executive budget in January is not issued by the mayor until April or May. Um, Jay, if you want to add anything on the on the political process, but the but it, it, it you know the legislature will then take over. The legislature will invite the chancellor to testify in Albany. Um, you'll all be you know briefed on that testimony, and um, the legislature is supposed to have a budget adopted by April first. Um, we, sh we shall see. <laughs> That is the process. Nothing to add on the record, right? <laughs> Nothing on the record. <laughs> so we need to move the resolution to, so that we can bring this to the full board on the 23rd. On the 23rd the of this month, the budget resolution. Right. Do you have, is it a separate hand? They have. It. It's for their, right. and everybody has the budget resolution before the next. But it was, it was mailed to everybody. Yes, I could. We could. We could read the resolution. I could. It's. It's. It's a very. Where is it? I, it's supposed to be in front. Of, it's supposed to be part of your. Here it is. He has one. What's it attached? Oh, it's behind. The oh, minutes. it's attached to the minutes. Oh, uh -huh. got it. It's after the dormitory feed. There it is. From this wrap. Basically, page six of the. Uh, <laughs> that's that's right, the budget. Right, the last, right the, there. the last item. Item. I'll move it. Second. Any questions? Comments? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Any other questions? Any other comments? Let's go Yankees. See you next month. I hope they don't come home.